Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. And this is the opportunity because, um, you know, being part of GlowCur and then preparing for this workshop, I've had the opportunity to look at Quran translation from angles which I may not have thought about looking at them from before. Um, and including looking at the person of these translators, their stories, their trajectories, and reading about Muhammad Marmaduke Pickthall has been, for me, a very moving experience, um, an extremely productive life in just 60 or so years to see what he produced and the age at which he was able to do so many things. Um, I'm struck by his identity, as some has framed as a British Muslim, as someone who has that kind of name in my less Scottish nationalist moments. Uh, but a British Muslim today, to what extent is that similar and different from a British Muslim at the time of Pickthall? I'm also interested in his time in India um, as the son of immigrants coming from the former colonies. Uh, now the British Muslims, we are those people who were the Indians at that time, uh, among many other communities in Britain, of course. And I'm interested, you know, my in-laws are from Hyderabad, so I'm very interested in the Nizam of Hyderabad and his projects of patronage and support for Quran translations and many other works. And in particular, I'm looking today at Pickthall's time in Egypt, having gone to Egypt and before that to Palestine, Syria, spent time there and then arriving again with his almost complete Quran translation in 1929. And the experience he had at Al Azhar, which I had the opportunity to study at and graduate from later on. So, this brings a lot of reflections as to what was being said about translation then. And then I'm comparing it to some extent, I'll make some reference to what we studied when I was an uh, undergraduate in the Department of Tafsir and Quranic Studies at Al Azhar. Slide, please. So, this account, uh, I've taken it screenshots like this, you don't have to read them in full, but we're just making some allusion to his own words, uh, from the biography called Loyal Enemy by Anne Fremantle. But as I understand, this account was originally published in the Islamic Culture Journal. And it spans about 12 or 13 pages um, of the book. And it talks about his arrival in Cairo. He had been in Hyderabad since 1924, had been working as the head teacher for a boys' school. And the Nizam, who had been supporting him, then gave him a couple of years off to work exclusively on his translation. And as part of that, he made his way to Egypt. And some have, and he was around the age of 54 at this time, some have said that uh, he was doing that to seek the, the authority or the rubber stamping, if you like, of Al Azhar. And one may certainly suggest that. But here he describes for himself what his reasons were. Number one, to avoid any mistakes that can be avoided in terms of the Arabic language. Secondly, to avoid any unorthodoxy. So this raises a lot of interesting questions. Um, and later on, we'll see that he actually denies that he is at all interested in receiving a fatwa, because as he says, we've got plenty of competent ulama in India. If I need rubber stamping, I will get it from there. Next slide, please. So this raises up some questions about al -Azhar. Uh, this is not a picture from the time, this is Prince Charles and um, Prince Camilla. Um, but this raises the question about authorities and to what extent people appeal to such authorities today. Um, indeed, they do. We can still find translations coming out in English and other languages in which it is explicitly said this was endorsed by such and such council of Al Azhar University or maybe some others. I guess the question that is going to come from looking at this story is to what extent that endorsement is meaningful? What purpose would there be in seeking it? What would make it meaningful to receive the endorsement of Al-Azhar? The conditions that we see here in 1929-30, are they markedly different from conditions today? I believe that is a question to explore, to go and see what is the status of those councils that are assessing and approving translations or disapproving. But al Azhar certainly at this point of time had an important place as it continues to have. It had risen in prominence and significance after 
the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, the end of the Sheikh al Islam uh, of the Ottoman Empire. And now Sheikh al Azhar becomes an ever important rule. So certainly, uh, Bikthal had respect for the Azhar institution. At one point, very tellingly, when he was in the midst of the conflict and it looked like Al Azhar was about to ban his translation, he says, the approval or the condemnation of Al-Azhar, or indeed of all the ulama of Egypt, could not help or injure my translation much. But from what I had so lately seen in Egypt, I could judge that condemnation, after all that had already happened, was very likely to bring a degree of ridicule upon Al-Azhar, which I should be the first to deplore. Al-Azhar is a great historic institution which one would wish to see reformed and not demolished. So here he is even expressing concern that if Al-Azhar were to condemn his translation, Al-Azhar itself might become stained. His own reputation would be more open to ridicule. Next slide, please. So there's the context here, which uh, Pickthall describes in his account, that there was a translation that had been burned not long before. And at other points, he mentions exactly which translation that was. It was of Muhammad Ali, uh, one of the founders and leaders of the Lahore Ahmadiyya branch. And he mentions here that uh, he had assumed that it was being burned due to some charge of heresy against it. Now, that may well be the case. I, I haven't had a chance to look at the, the documentation that surrounds that whole fire incident, except for a part of it. Uh, but Pixel himself doesn't make clear where he stands on this question of heresy, whether Muhammad Ali's translation contains some kind of heresy. We do know that Pixel makes some reference to Muhammad Ali's commentary, draws from it, quotes from it. Um, and you know you can see in Abraham Kidwai's assessment of Pickthall's translation, this is one of the things that irks him a great deal, is that he mentions uh, Muhammad Ali and doesn't condemn him, and doesn't label him, and doesn't attack him. So this may be, uh, uh, and you heard it here first, because he was from the woke institution of woking, right? So because they had this more cosmopolitan type of, uh, of the situation there, it takes some time to sink in. Because they had this in, in walking this kind of cosmopolitan community, uh, at that time we don't see much of this kind of uh, opprobrium between uh, different sects and point of view. Next slide, please. So, as he mentions quite early on, the ulama at this time were divided. We had what Pickford describes as the diatribe by Muhammad Shaki, specifically against uh, him. Now, what I have uh, so far located is a book which contains his earlier four uh, essays, which uh, were published in one of the newspapers in Egypt, in which a brief mention is made of Muhammad Ali's translation, but it's not specifically about him. But as Pickthall says about the broader condemnation of the very idea of translating the Quran, and this is, of course, wrapped up in many different issues which have been touched on already. Um, fears that have been brought on by what was happening in Turkey, uh, the secular agenda, the view that the Quran was going to be translated and the original replaced and removed and people would shift towards using translations instead of the Quran as it was revealed in Arabic. Um, in fact, uh, Shakir mentions in this, like I say, this is prior to uh, the Pikthal incident. He mentions that we need to have the Ghadda Hamidiyya, we need to have a, a Hamidian rage and he's referring to the, the, the last Ottoman Caliph, but he wasn't referring to the translation issue specifically. He means the anger that he showed when the French were about to show a play uh, about the Prophet Muhammad, and he made a big threat against them. So he says, we need this kind of rage, and who's going to have this rage first? It should be us Egyptians that should have this Ghadda Hamidiyya. Uh, and in this book also, I mean, in this, these articles, he says that every Muslim, male and female, should sit down with themselves before God, put their right hand on their left hand and make a pledge that if I encounter any translation of the Quran, I will destroy it and burn it. And they should pledge that between themselves and God. So there was, there's a lot going on in the context. What is being feared here? What is the, the concern? And a lot of those points are indeed wrapped up in technicalities about what is translation and how does it relate to other things like the seed? How does it relate to the Ahruf Sab'a? All sorts of things are being raised, but of course, uh, within a political context as well. So we have Muhammad Shakir, of course, the father of two very famous called Ahmed Muhammad Shakir and Khmud Muhammad Shakir. And then on the other side, we have the likes of the Sheikh Al-Azhar, 
Muhammad al Ahmadi al Zawahiri. I won't say no relation, but actually, he is a relation. He's a grandfather of a contemporary Zawahiri, very well known in the terrorism studies department. Uh, so, al Zawahiri was a grand imam between 1929 to 1935. Before him and after him was Muhammad Mustafa al Maragi, who is pro translation. Um, so, this is the context of, of the, the names that are going to be dropped in the midst of this uh, account from Pictho. Um, I'll come back to Manahil al Arfan later. We have a book by Sheikh uh, Muhammad Abdul Aziz Zulqani. It's one of the, the core works in Quranic, Quranic sciences that is referenced by contemporary writers and is also still taught in Al Azhar. Um, and this you know, presents the kind of framing of the issue that still exists today. Um, we have Tarjama Harfiya, Tarjama Ma'nawiya. Zulqani actually talks about Tarjama to Tafsir. This is what he endorsed, that we should do translation of Tafsir. And not, by the way, and what was quite interesting, uh, contrary to what a lot of people say, is that he does not endorse the idea of Tarjama to Ma'an al Quran, translation of the meanings of the Quran. In fact, he explicitly says that does not make sense. He said, number one, because um, this gives the impression that it is an actual tarjama al Quran, which is the problem. We don't want that. Why does it give that impression? Because all tarjama is of meaning, all translation is mediated by meaning, as we know. Um, and he says, tarjama, this is the second reason. Translation only applies to the words, not to the meanings. So There's no such thing as translation of the meanings. Uh, so this actually is actually more subtle, if you like, than what people sometimes describe to the Azhari position. By the way, there are still some people who oppose translation. Um, and I've put a flat earth here because there are some people who also believe in a flat earth. Um, so while some people are building satellites and, uh, and, and all the things that follow from that, there are some people who are saying it cannot be done, right? So the same thing applies to translation that one may oppose it in principle, but you know, what good is that now? in this century. Next slide, please. So, Maraghi, Muhammad Mustafa Maraghi is pictured here. He received Pixel very kindly. Uh, he showed him a lot of trust. At one point he says to him, look, I'm, I'm telling you things, but if you, as long as you're sure about what you're doing, if you have the conviction, then you go ahead and don't listen to us, right? Um, so, in turn, uh, Pictol speaks about Maragi very highly and, and in very glowing terms. And he mentions that uh, because Al Azhar is, is headed by someone who's opposed to this, um, and therefore, you know, and the king is opposed to it, so it's not going to happen officially through Al Azhar. So we're going to need to find some, some way around this. We can find some other Azharis who are not doing it on behalf of the institution who can support you and help you in what we need in terms of revising your work. So that's ultimately what happened. Uh, he met someone called Ramrawi Bey, as he calls him, Muhammad Bey Ahmed al Ramrawi, who is a lecturer in chemistry. Next slide, please. A gratuitous picture of Taha Hussein because he was in one of these gatherings. It's very interesting reading Pictol's you know, biographies and so on because of all the people that he knew, all the people that he met. It's fascinating, including Churchill, his school friend. Um, but he says here, and this is the point that. Uh, I had come to seek the help of Arab learned men on points of Arabic. He had not come to seek a fatwa because the Arab scholars have their role, but we need to have some confidence, I'm paraphrasing here, in non-Arab Muslims, non-Arab Islam, non-Arab institutions as well. So what they did, uh, they got to work, and along the way, they would send occasional queries to uh, Al-Maragi, um, although they had to frame that in Arabic because Maragi did not speak English. Next slide, please. So they were carrying on with their work for some months quite happily, and then uh, a shock came from Hamid Shakir. Hamid Shakir, who had raised, as Pictou says, the hue and cry against Muhammad Ali's translation, and now he's coming for Pictou. So he had written in the Ahram, under a, a heading of a translation of the Quran, that the translator and all who read his translation or abet or show approval of it are condemned to everlasting perdition. This is Pickthall's own characterization. Maybe it's, but having read his work, it sounds like pretty much uh, probably a direct translation. 
I was solemnly advised to give up my nefarious work and translate instead of all imaginable substitutes, the commentary of At-Tabari. So what we don't have here, uh, and I would like to find out, what the rationale was in the choice of At-Tabari, maybe it was just to say, well, this is important. Why don't you go and translate a whole of At-Tabari, then that would be good, you know, just to keep him busy. <laughs> um, maybe it was uh, something about his personal perspective about the importance of Tafsir Al-Tabari. Maybe he wanted something like we heard about before, the Tibyan and the Mawaki, you know, some kind of blend uh, which incorporates Tabari's uh, own uh, opinion. Uh, but Pickthaw himself gives two reasons why this would not work. Number one, the bulk is enormous of bulk, and would, besides, secondly, require another commentary of equal length to make its methods and mentality intelligible to English people who had never studied the Quran commentary. So we're taking people further and further away from the purpose. Next slide, please. And translating tafsir is something that, you know, I'm involved in, I do plenty of it, um, and the property has been translated in part now, but still, the collective Ummah has not managed to translate in English, the probably in other languages, probably Turkish. I'm guessing because Turks have been working hard on translation, Persians as well. Uh, now, there have been small attempts. Uh, we have Cooper's partial translation, we have Scott Lucas's partial translation now. And uh, currently, I know some people working on a translation of a Mukhtasar of Tabari. Um, which would give us something like what we're saying about this kind of what would Tabari's translation of the Quran look like? Uh, this opens up a theoretical minefield, um, something I've decided to call predetermined exegetical translation, where you could take something like a Tabari and say, well, what would a Tabari's translation look like? But that faces some problems. Number one, that we don't have enough information in the commentary always to show what choices to make in the translation. Secondly, that the, the commentator, the exegete, may well give you a plurality of views, and then you'd have to narrow it down where the exegete had not done so. So later on, we have the emergence, the Azhari position is that we should translate tafsir. So in order to do that, we have to produce a tafsir. That was called al muntakhab And the muntakhab was then translated. Uh, the muntakhab was produced in the, in the 80s, Mukhari was telling me. And then in 1999, sorry, 1993 comes the first English translation. And you should definitely read uh, Stefan Wild's uh, account of it. Uh, right from the beginning, this translation, Alhamdulillah, was translated. Bosoms peep forth and give thanks to God. This was the learned uh, medical doctor who translated it thus, drawing from something from Shakespeare and patching it with something else. So Alhamdulillah became Bosoms peep forth and give thanks to God. So Somebody noticed the problem, thankfully. It was revised, and another translation was issued in 2006 by a team of translators, including uh, Muhammad Ghali, uh, who also has another translation by his own name with the same team. And so it should be mentioned that there are various Azari translators who have acted independently. Uh, some of them have sought the approval and the authority of Al-Azhar, others just you know, it's known in their biography that there are Azharis, and maybe that's enough. Uh, so there's uh, Ghali, as I mentioned. Muhammad Abu Halim has an association with Al-Azhar from his uh, pre-university days. Uh, Ahmed Zaki Hamad's translation, Muhammad, uh, sorry, Mustafa uh, Khattab's translation, uh, which he explicitly uh, got the approval from Al-Azhar as well. So yes, there's the institutional aspect, as Nathaniel also was alluding to, and the non-institutional approaches, slide please. So, as uh, Pickfall mentions, there were some responses to uh, Sheikh Shakir's article. There were dissenters from within Al Azhar, and there clearly were different points of view. And he said that many Egyptian Muslims were as surprised as I was at the extraordinary ignorance of present world conditions of men who claim to be the thinking heads of the Islamic world. Men who think that the Arabs are still the patrons and the non Arabs, their freedmen. These air quotes are from the text. We cannot see that the positions have become reversed, that the Arabs are no longer the fighters and the non-Arabs the stay-at-homes, but it is the non-Arabs who at present bear the brunt of the jihad. And I assume that by jihad here, he means the da'wah, but he's using the word jihad, intellectual jihad. 
So what happens next is invited to speak to a group of students. And these are supposed to be, as he calls them, modern students. But it turns out that it's a bit of an ambush. Next slide, please. He mentions, and this is not from the school, from the number of turbans and long flowing robes, I judged that all Alaska was present. So he had to change the content of his speech. He's said a little bit in Arabic. He, you know, ticks some boxes with them, try to bring them on site. And then he gives this speech in which he presents the rationale for translation, just more in more general terms, where we are at this moment as an ummah, the crossroads, the, uh, you know, the, the, the change in the style of the confrontation between East and West. So he's making reference here to the Treaty of Hudaybiyah and how that was an opportunity for Muslims to, to spread their message. So he says here, for centuries, war had set a rigid barrier between the Muslim world and Christendom. And now that barrier is down. No matter that the terms of settlement seem ignominious, ignominious sorry, to the Muslims. That settlement may yet prove to be the greatest victory that Islam has yet achieved. On one condition, a hard one, that all Muslims show again in their conduct, the faith and virtue of the early Muslims. Or do you think, I asked them, that Islam was propagated by the sword? And then everyone says, no, no. Um, and God forbid. Ma'adullah. I told them how the Arabic speaking peoples are respected by non Arabs, more especially in India, how we look to them, for example. Uh, and then Rashid Rada, who's pictured here, he was in the audience. I don't know if he always wore this uh, turban, but he was sitting in the audience listening to this. And afterwards, he stood up and said some words in support of Pickthall and, and backing up what he has just said. So let's go back to Maravi. Next slide, please. Pickthall is sitting with Maragi, they're having a frank conversation. Maragi starts to show him the Hanafi fatwas that allow for translation of the Quran. As Pickthall says, as if he just wanted me to know that he was traditional in his approach. Um, and then he, I told him, he says, that my translation will not have the uh, Arabic text and the, and the English side by side. Of course, many editions of it did turn out to be that way. Yes, why not? I explained that there were several reasons. For one thing, it would cost a great deal more. For another, it would repel non-Muslim readers who, glancing the book and finding it half full of Arabic, would lay it down unread as something quite outside their sphere of interest. So he felt that it would be off-putting just from a visual perspective. And he makes an argument in his discussion with Maravi, although he didn't have to, that he, he cited the ayah 194 of al so because people have, in a way, attacked us with their translations, so we have to, we have to fight back with our translations. Next slide, please. There are a lot of twists in this tale. Now we have Sheikh Zawahiri is, is, is going to rear his head. Sheikh Zawahiri uh, is at lunch with a, a lot of people, including Pixel, and the translation is mentioned. Zawahiri is kind of quiet about it. And then uh, Pickthall's friend says, oh, he's not going to call it Al-Qur'an. He's going to call it Ma'an Al-Qur'an, or Al-Qur'an Majeed. So Zawahiri says, uh, if he does that, then there can be no objection. We shall all be pleased with it. And he forgot to say it, inshallah. So by the way, Zawahiri is not mentioned uh, by name. He's only called Sheikh al in this account. But later on, um, they started to probe. So Pickthall mentions that, you know, there's been some correspondence and questioning going on, what's going on. It looks like a condemnation is about to emerge from Al-Azhar. Uh, the latest rumor was that Al-Azhar decided that the work must be translated word for word back into Arabic and submitted to their judgment in that distorted form as none of the professors could read English. You know, we don't have to go into the many ways in which this is unreasonable. Uh, but again, for some people, that seemed like a reasonable process to, to, to expect. But look at his optimism. It was certainly a great advance beyond the method of condemning without trial, pursued in the case of Mohammed Muhammad Ali's English version, showing that even within al Azhar, there is now a party of enlightenment strong enough to force withdrawal from the opposition. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, so, yes, we are near the end. Translations and meanings. Okay, minefield, we talk about this all the time. We all make fun of Tarjum uh, al Quran. Well, there is the proposition of calling the translation the Quran. And in fact, plenty are still published like that. Um, 
Sometimes they'll stick an adjective in front and think that changes it. The noble Quran, the gracious Quran, the clear Quran. Well, it's still, you're calling it the Quran. You're not calling it a translation of the Quran. But many of these people were condemning also the idea of calling it translation of the Quran because that implied something to them about a kind of replacement. Uh, that's how they saw this expression. Now, when Pixel says the meaning of the glorious Quran, is this really a concession? I don't see it, to be honest. So I, I noticed that Lawrence says, pay attention to this first word in the title, meaning. Well, the first word is the, the meaning of the Holy Quran. <laughs> so as soon as you say the meaning and you put it in the singular, it's as if there is one meaning of the glorious Quran and this is it. At least when you say our translation or you say translation of the Quran, there is some way to understand that as an attempt uh, to convey some of the meaning. Um, translation of the meanings I mentioned what uh, Zulkani said. And I will answer the question, who is fit to assess a translation, whether before publishing or after? We, we do have an industry of books and studies, MA theses and so on, which assess translations. Um, and I have this one, which I picked up at Alaska. Oh, it's for English type as well, a critical study of someone from the faculty of Arabic language at Alaska. Now, next slide, please. This was a particular qualm that they raised about his translation. They said, when you translated, Pikthal has translated it, let not thy hand be chained to thy neck, nor open it with a complete opening. He considers that by thus translating the Arabic because literally I have turned a commandment relating to miserliness and generosity into a commandment concerning the position of a man's hands. Now this goes back to their perspective and their theory about translation that it should be a translation of the tafsir. So the tafsir is don't be miserly, don't be uh, extravagant in spending. So you should translate that. Don't translate the original expression because it will not be understood in any language of the world because no other language of the world has the khasa'is of Lugat al-Arabiya. So here Pixel is saying, well, in English, we have an expression like this to be tight-fisted, to be open-handed. Uh, and that every English reader will understand my literal translation in precisely the same sense in which the Arabic reader understands the Arabic text. <laughs> the ban is therefore based upon an altogether false assumption. So 80 years later, page 79, he raises the exact same complaint about Pictor's translation, unaware that this has been, you know, this argument has taken place many decades before. Final slide, please. So here we have uh, another expression of this kind of optimism, like you see, uh, where he says, there's something hopeful in the actual condemnation, the terms of which are wonderfully mild. One might almost say favorable to the translator as compared with former pronouncement of the same authority. It makes the close of a long chapter in the history of the relations of Arabs and non-Arabs, a chapter of whose tenor the prophet would assuredly have disapproved, since the position that all translation of the Quran is sinful has been quite abandoned. A translation of the Quran by a Muslim has been examined and a literary reason has been given for its condemnation. That is a great step forward. <laughs> so fortunately that wasn't the final moment, but just a little bit later, he received the blessing. I received the blessing of the University of Lazhar on my work and got a letter in the nature of a testimonial from Sheikh Marahi on the understanding that it would not be called a translation of the Quran, but something like the meaning of the Quran. By the way, if you look at the, this is the first edition, the, the meaning of the glorious Quran and explanatory translation. So it is actually being called a translation. So I think some will put over some eyes. You cannot imagine the labor of the revision has been owing entirely to the hair-splitting mentality of the Arab experts, but it is done. Now I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>